Okay, thank you all for coming. I'm Freddie. I am an instructor here at Annenberg. I teach in the Masters of Communication Management program. One of my courses is about web design strategies. So this is a highly condensed, rapid, fast-paced version of all the user experience topics that I teach in this one class. So I will talk a million miles a second. Feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions, you don't understand what I'm saying, you need me to repeat something. So I like this illustration. It's not entirely accurate, but it just shows the difference between design and user experience. Design, this looks so nice, a nice right angle, but users want something else. And when we don't give users what they want, they get frustrated. So as an example, once upon a time, I was on a site called Facebook. You may have heard of Facebook. And I came across this ad right here. Now, I love cats. I have a lot of cats. So I immediately fixated on the ad, and I also love modern design. So that combination of cats and modern design compelled me to click on the ad. Now, when you look at the click-through rate on Facebook ads, only one out of 10,000 people click on any ad. So it's a rarity, and most people click on accident. So I actually clicked through on the ad, and I came across this site which I had never heard of before in my life. I'm pretty much a steadfast Amazon consumer. So if it's on, not on Amazon, I rarely buy it. But Amazon doesn't sell cat pods. So I went to check this out, and everything was ghosted back. I couldn't get into the site and check it out and learn more unless I did what? Gave up my personal information. Gave up my email address. And as I said, I did not know this company. I'd never heard of fab.com in my life. I didn't know if they were a legitimate company, a front for the North Korean mafia. I didn't know what they were going to do with my email address because they certainly don't say what they need my email address for. And you may have encountered this too, where you go to an e-commerce site and before you can even look inside, they want your personal information. Now, you can imagine what would happen if you were shopping someplace in Los Angeles and you go up to a store, never heard of the store before, you see something in the window that sounds interesting, you start walking into the store and they said, hi, can we have your email address and phone number, please? Most of us would turn around and leave. And that's what I did here. Now, sometimes if I'm really curious, I'll put in a fake email address. I'll put in whatever at whatever.com and they'll let me in. Neither of which benefits the website because obviously a fake email address is useless to them. It just clutters their database. And me leaving the website after just visiting it is called a bounce. And that statistic isn't great for search engine optimization. And it doesn't look great when you show your boss or your client either that all these people came to your site and they left after 15 seconds. That's a good way to lose their account or lose your job. So what we call this in user experience, whenever you put anything between your customer and what they want to achieve, we call this friction. And if there's one thing that you take away from the next two hours, it's that friction is what you should eliminate in everything you do. And friction, so we see friction all over the place. When you wanna sign up for a course, at USC. How hard is it to find the classes you want? How hard is it to register? Friction, when you want to go buy lunch and there's a huge line, that's friction. It just makes everything difficult. Now in the real world, we're a little more forgiving. We may detest traffic on the 10 freeway, but there's nothing we can do about it. So we put up with it, we stay on the freeway. But on the internet, we have too many choices. So something bothers us, we leave. And so there are some sites that are arrogant because they know we have no choice. If you've ever had to use Blackboard at USA, you understand. We have no choice but to use Blackboard. So it's filled with friction. It's sometimes difficult to use Blackboard. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about friction, but also more importantly, understanding your users, what they're about. And as mentioned, um, well, let me tell you about Fab and their little friction. So they put a lot of money into this company, founded in 2010, 
156 million dollars in funding to start an e-commerce shop and they had some interesting products and then just five years later they sold for 15 million you do not need an MBA to know that's not good business now there are a lot of reasons for this but I think one key reason was the user experience you'll notice Amazon's got a completely different experience you don't have to be a registered Amazon user to enjoy the site. You can shop, you can download things. Now Amazon wants you to join Amazon Prime because that's where all its profits are, but Amazon is almost the role model in user experience when it comes to e-commerce. So as mentioned, we have friction here at USC, which you have all encountered. Maybe you recognize this screen. Right? Every time you try to log into USC, we have this dual factor authentication. It's a necessary evil because USC is trying to protect its servers from hackers. But when I want to post something to Blackboard for my students, I'll say I have the friction of first having to go to USC, then logging in. You would think the login page would be on the same page that you get to. And then it says, go to your phone. Then I have to launch this. Then I have to click another button, then I have to click another button, and finally I get to Blackboard. That's six steps to do what I want to do. And I have to do this, I don't have a choice, but if I had a choice, I'd go for something leaner. So, in short, just so you know some of these terms here, UX stands for user experience, and it's the complete physical and emotional reaction to what you're going through. It's complete. When you go to Disneyland, it's not digital, but there's a user experience there. Some of it is good, you may enjoy the rides, and some of it is bad, having to wait an hour or longer in line to get to the ride. So that's user experience. It's everything, everything that we do, this, this classroom has a user experience. My teaching is part of the user experience that you are experiencing today. UI, and this UX is, all the senses. Not much of a smell in this classroom, but there's certainly stuff you can see, these weird fluorescent lights, humming sound in the background, which may bug some people, right? Are the chairs comfortable enough for you? So all your senses contribute to user experience. Obviously on the internet, we're mostly focused with visuals and auditory, and then lots of typing. Or if you're using your phone, lots of swiping. So all elements contribute to user experience. User interface, UI, and that's a course that's gonna be taught in a couple of weeks here. Is it next week? Yeah. Next week, uh, my business partner is gonna be teaching user interface, and that's the place where people interact with the device. So when you go to the cupcake ATM over here at the bookstore, the user interface is that screen that you type through. Right now, you're all playing with the user interface on your computer, the keyboard, the screen. So it contributes to UX, but it's primarily design, because we're just talking about interaction. There's a UX to it, but it's focused primarily on design. Uh, here with user experience, I'm gonna really emphasize who your users are when you define a website. And one thing to note is it's not just customers. If you think of a website like USC, you think of all the different types of users that use the USC website. Yes, we have uh, students, but we have current students and maybe future students, people who want to apply here. We have their parents. We've got past students we call alumni that want to come to the site. And some alumni are donors and they have a different need. We have professors, people who want to be professors, guys who want to play for the football team. We have a lot of different users, many of whom have a different objective. So when we talk about users, the most important thing for you to do when you develop your UX is brainstorm every possible person who might want to come to your website. And then next to them, what do they want? What do they want? So when we think about you know, some possibilities, I just listed all these when I think about shopping. Well, obviously there are people who want to buy products, but there are people who have already bought products who want customer service. Hey, this thing broke, how do I return it? 
you know, hey, I heard uh, that there's a discount, but I didn't get a discount when I entered the discount code. So that's a user need. Sometimes people want to sell you something. Where's the link to sell you something? And a giant organization like USC buys millions of dollars worth of products per year. So whoever made this desk had to sell it to USC. How do they find out how to sell it to USC? And it would behoove USC to make it easier. Go through these channels. If you have a startup company, your customers may be investors. You created this whole thing, but what you really want is money. Do you make it easy for your investors to surf your site? And then there are all these people who want to apply for a job. If you have a nonprofit organization, volunteers are really important. You can't hire everybody. But a lot of nonprofit organizations are so focused on donations, they don't make it easy to volunteer. Uh, some people need HR help. If you work for a company and you're saying, hey, I don't understand this dental insurance. Can you help me figure it out? That can be difficult. And then we have journalists who are coming to your site to do a story about you. And we all need, could use more publicity. If you are USC Athletics, then journalists are a vital part of your existence. So we make it easy for the journalist to come in, easy for the journalist to make an appointment to speak to the head coach, easy for the journalist to get access to events, to get photographs. And then we have people who just are coming to this website because we want to learn more. We want to research more. We're not going to be a customer. We go to the Huffington Post because we want to read an article and learn about it. We're not going to buy anything from the Huffington Post. We're a different kind of user. We may come to USC to read some of the articles there, learn about the school. Maybe we're writing an article about universities. Maybe we're writing a book. And then there are users we don't want. So sometimes we want a negative user experience for them. A troll is somebody on the internet who just likes to say mean things to other people for fun. That's their sport. So we might get a group of UCLA students coming onto the USC website to type something. Let's make it a little more difficult for them. And hackers, obviously they would want I talked to somebody who works in IT here, and he says somebody tries to hack the USC website every single day. Probably somebody who got a bad grade in a class and wants to change that grade. But every day. So this is why they did the, they added friction, the dual factor authentication, which made life a little bit difficult for all of us, but this is a user they definitely do not want. So this is, you know, another key thing to take away from this course is, what do people want on your site? And when we determine these needs, we create personas. Now, if you've taken marketing before, you may have created personas in your marketing class. You would say, this is Mandy the Millennial, and here's what she likes, and she loves cats, and she likes spending time on Snapchat. So we get kind of a personality profile of a typical customer. It's a little different when you're doing UX. Because when we are developing personas for website development, we don't care so much if they have cats or like chocolate, unless we're selling cat food and chocolate, or chocolate for cats. Instead, we want to create personas on their needs. So in a lot of cases, we don't care about their age, their gender, or their race, unless it's really relevant. Now, if I'm designing a website for the American Association of Retired People, I'm going to have a lot of senior citizens. Therefore, age is relevant because I'm going to have older people access the website. I need bigger type to accommodate for eyesight. I may even need to make sure that Things are more visible. They don't recognize a lot of the symbols that your generation recognizes. Like I'm sure all of you have seen this symbol someplace on a website or an app, right? Do you know what this is? It's a menu. It's a menu. Your generation knows that. My aunt and uncle said, what the heck is that? They don't know what that is. It doesn't say menu. It's just three lines. You grew up knowing certain iconography. You instantly recognize it. 
my mother, who's in her 70s, I bought her a CD player, and she was looking for the play button. Because she didn't know the difference between the single arrow and the double arrow. She didn't understand those symbols. So the user experience of a really cheap CD player was too difficult for her because they didn't bother to say play, stop, they took out the language. For a nice clean design, but the clean design was not user friendly. So serve the designer, not the user. And by the way, some of the things I'm gonna talk about today are common practice. You'll see, this hamburger menu in a lot of places today. You'll see almost every shopping website pop up a window asking you for an email address. It's very common. Just because something is common does not make it good UX. It's a design trend. Designers decided, we love the look of this. It's so modern, let's put it on our site. And I, for one, counsel my clients never do the pop up window asking for email. Let people experience your website first. Let people buy something first before you intrude upon their privacy. What's common doesn't make it good. What's common isn't a best practice, it's a common practice. There are lots of things that we do in life that aren't necessarily good for us. It's just that everyone else does it too. So when we create these personas, as you create this fictitious person, don't talk about that she's, you know, a millennial Latina uh, who lives in Pasadena, because that's not relevant to developing my website for, for Amazon. I don't care about her age. I don't care where she lives, really, because almost every place in the United States is the same when accessing a website. So it's irrelevant information. Instead, Number one, most important, what do they want to accomplish on the website? Why are they here? What are their concerns and challenges? Somebody who's colorblind would have a real struggle on a website that's mostly red and green. So if you're developing that Christmas website and all your buttons are red or green, they all look gray to somebody who's colorblind. That's a challenge. Their concerns, Maybe they're really worried about privacy. And here you are asking for email address, here you are asking for all this information. So we need to know, what are the concerns as they go to your website? Maybe they are dyslexic, and it's hard for them to read a lot of text, particularly if you make your text really small. And they might be better off watching a video. They would prefer to watch a video. So we need to think about that. How web and tech savvy are they? You know, for most of you, you're all very web and tech savvy, as I can see right now. But as I said, my mother has never even been on the internet, and she doesn't want to go. And so whenever somebody calls her at her bank and says, oh, you could just go on our website and get your statement, she then calls me, go get my statement and send it to me by mail. What do they prefer with their content? Some of you are readers. You're college students, so you're readers. But not everyone likes to read a ton of text. Do what they prefer in video format. Now, I prefer text over videos. I don't want to watch a TED Talk. I just say, give me your magazine article. I can read faster than I can to listen to you. So I'm kind of the opposite. And when I've done training in the past, for example, USC makes me do cybersecurity training they make me watch a lot of videos, which for me is painful. It's friction because I can read the articles faster instead of saying, this is the internet. Many things can go wrong on the internet. If they're an article, I can skip that. To learn about our users, what other sites do they use a lot and like? So if you know somebody is a heavy Facebook user, that gives you a clue on what they're used to um, you may know, like, on Facebook, it's really easy to post something and add a comment. Whereas if you go to use Blackboard, you have to go into this formatting page, compose there, hit publish, and then it may look totally different. So we're so used to Facebook's ease of use, when we go to another platform like Blackboard, the user experience seems much more difficult. It would behoove, if I were working for Blackboard right now, 
I'd say, look, my users right now, college students, are used to Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram. And maybe it's time to update our user experience to resemble that more, right now it resembles more of a blog format. And your generation is blogging less and using the social networks more. And this is really important too. What is their value to you? Not all users are created equal. If, you know, I am USC, I obviously have a priority. I do care about prospective students. I definitely care about donors. I don't care so much maybe about uh, people who want to buy tickets to a football game. We'll create another website for them. But I'm not going to make it a priority on USC.edu front page button that says buy football tickets now. They're not our priority. So we're not going to give them, because otherwise you get into this argument where every user is of equal importance and the whole front page becomes a lot of buttons. Apply to be a student now. Donate money now. Buy football tickets now. Get parking at University Village now. That's a lot of different uses. So we decide, we do a hierarchy. Who are our most important users? Maybe it's in terms of numbers. Maybe it's in terms of level of influence, how powerful they are. Maybe we value good customers as opposed to bad customers. And then when you create your persona and you present this to your design team, mention only the data and details that are relevant. Nothing that doesn't have anything to do with web design. Because in marketing, as I mentioned, we create these personas and we say, this person loves Beyonce. Well, unless I'm a music site, I don't care. If I'm designing USC, that's irrelevant. So let me, um, oh, and then one last thing you do to help your design team for each of these personas, you create a usage scenario. So if we create a person, we create Cassandra customer, and we say these are the steps right now that she has to take to solve her problem, to get her need met. And now your design team can see step by step, and you might even accompany it with little pictures and say, and in this case, Cassandra wants to return a product. What are all the steps she has to undergo to return a product? So let's look at Cassandra customer. This is a typical persona. She wants to return some shoes she bought from us. Lots of, lots of shoe websites have free returns. Here's the thing, she hates the hassle of returning. So she buys shoes from us once. If it's so difficult to return, that's the last time she'll ever buy shoes from us again. Because like that's too much trouble, I'd rather just go to Macy's down the street. So much easier. And she hates having to dig through a website to look for information. She wants to talk to somebody. She's somebody who, there's something, actually something called a conversation user interface. You know those little chat boxes drop down these days, how can I help you today? That's what Cassandra likes. She wants to talk, that's just her nature. So that's her concern. Hates returning, wants to talk. So already my web design team is thinking about how can we accommodate Cassandra. And we know that she's pretty good at social media, but she doesn't like to read a lot of text or click a lot of links. She's not a person who's like, click once, two, three, four, five times, she's gone. She's given up. So if we bury something, we call this clicks deep. How many clicks deep do you make something? And some customers just don't have the patience to keep on digging and digging and digging. All right, I'm done. I'm never shopping here again. We learn what other sites that she likes. Instagram, Pinterest, Zappos. All three are very photo intensive. She loves photos and captions. So maybe our explanation to her on how to return shoes is photo intensive. How she found us, she saw our shoes on an Instagram celebrity. That helps the marketing team. But we also know that, again, she's social media savvy. So now, knowing some of this, we do know we want to assess her value because how much do we want to redesign our website for Cassandra customer? And keep in mind that a sample persona may represent thousands of customers. 
So how much do we care about customers like Cassandra who wants to return shoes? Maybe we don't want to be helpful because every time they return a pair of shoes, it costs us $19. That's what happens at Zappos. Every time somebody returns shoes, it costs them $19. So you'll notice some websites make it really easy to buy, really difficult to return. Or you'll notice other things in life, really easy to sign up for cable service, really difficult to cancel. So here, she's not a regular customer. Well, then she's not that important to us, is she? And the return will cost us money, but the one thing that concerns us is that she is very social media savvy and active. So even though she's not a regular customer, we may decide she's valuable because if she has a bad experience, she's going to go on social media and tell everybody. She can influence other people. She's a potential. Yes? I took a, maybe we'll cover it later. But yeah. Where do you get this information from? I'll cover that later. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. So, once we have all this information, then we sit down with the team. We don't have to do what Cassandra needs. We may decide Cassandra is of tertiary importance to us. She's not, we want to focus on our VIP customers, not her. And we may decide that, you know, some of these things, a chat interface would be nice to have, and we'll put it under a category called nice to have, but we're not going to do it right now because it's going to cost us money. And we don't want to spend the time and money on it. So we'll put it under future consideration. Let's look at another one. Jane Job Hunter. But you notice I like the alliteration where I had the first name sound like their use. It's easier for your design team to remember. Jane Job Hunter. And what I'm going to know, when you go into a meeting, you will assign somebody to be each persona. So you might be Cassandra and you might be Jane. And you represent her at that meeting. You are her at that meeting. And you're gonna advocate for her at that meeting. So Jane Job Hunter, Jane is looking for a job. But right now she's just searching. So that's her need. She wants a good cultural fit. She went to a company that had a bad, toxic environment. Uh, she's very socially conscious, so she wants a good cultural fit. A company with strong values and ethics, not just in words, but in actions. Because she knows every time she goes to a company, she'll go to Wells Fargo and they talk about how much they care about the customers and how much they care about the world, but they didn't live up to it in their own actions. And so she's burnt, been burnt before by w working for companies that say they're good, but aren't as good as their words describe. So for my design team, I'm really <coughs> thinking, if we care about Jane, if we want more employees like Jane, we should probably have a section on our website talking about all the good deeds that we have done. Here's a project that we have done, physically done. Here are the results. She mostly uses her phone. That's what we found from the research. What does that tell us? It means that her screen is this big, and she's got slow connections. So if we're gonna serve up a lot of big photographs, she may stop surfing our website because it's gonna slow down her entire experience. So for Jane the Job Hunter, we might do better with a fast loading video, short text, something that's, that works. She likes LinkedIn, she also likes our competitors. So we'll look at there and see if there are any cues from there that we can learn from. How did she learn about us? She saw one of our executives speak at a conference, which helps our marketing team. Okay, marketers, we need to send more executives to conferences. Now, is she important to us? Yes. We may be a startup. We may be expanding. We may be struggling to replace a bunch of people who left or quit. We have major employee needs. Jane Job Hunter is very important to us maybe our top priority, because we cannot get enough employees. And you'll see this right now in the United States where people are struggling to hire qualified personnel because of the job market. So you see, this shapes our website and our marketing. So create these personas. Now, you also have an excellent question. How do we learn about these people? Where do we get this information? Well, certainly we can ask them. 
In other courses, you may have studied market research, surveys, focus groups, that kind of thing. So I'm not going to tell you about that. I'm going to tell you about things that you can do within your web design agency or your web design practice. So obviously on websites, we can ask questions and questionnaires. When people register for the site, log in for the first time, we obviously ask them for their email address and a password. Now, anything else we ask them may be considered friction, so don't get carried away. I have registered for websites where I was like, really, 30 questions to become a member? Maybe I don't want to become a member. We're good for a handful of questions, maybe fewer than 10 questions. So knowing this, knowing that we uh, have only a limited number of questions, we want to focus on what's actionable, useful for us in terms of designing the website. So at this point, maybe I'm not going to ask them what their income level is. Lots of websites like to ask you are your income level, which some people see as an invasion of privacy. And you also wonder, why do the web designers need to know how much money I make? That seems a little irrelevant. Why do they need to know my gender if the site is not gender specific? Don't ask me that question. So only ask stuff that's relevant and useful. And in fact, every time somebody on your team wants to ask a question, counter and say, will that make our site better? Will that make our site more relevant to the consumers? If not, don't ask the question. Don't ask the question. So we can ask in registration, but you know what? An even better time to ask questions is after the transaction. After they have bought something, applied to the university, right? uh, subscribed to our newsletter, when they're done. Because now it's not friction. They got what they wanted, or we hope so. Now we can ask them some more questions. So here's another place where we can ask fewer than 15 questions about their experience. And I'll show you, now there is a bias because after we're done with it, the people who tend to answer surveys, as you may know, are people with really strong feelings, which means they were either ecstatic or they were angry. People who are like, yeah, it's fine, don't bother. That's not their time. So keep that in mind when you look at user surveys, the intensity of the argument. You know, 80% of your customers may think it's fine. 10% say this is the best website on the planet. 10% say I hate this website. So again, take their information and you have to make a value judgment. How important are their complaints? And is it something that's urgent? Or is it something that's nice to have? I always like the nice to have category. That's when you get extra funding and an extra year and you throw in the nice to have stuff. But here are the most important questions you ask. So you can ask a lot of questions at this point, 15, but these are your top three questions. What was your purpose of your site visit today? Why did you come here? What did you want to accomplish today? Key question number two, were you able to complete the task? Could you do it? And question number three, if not, why not? Most important. These three questions, you know, maybe this comes, these three questions come in an email after somebody's been a customer. They bought something from your store. Thank you so much. Please take this survey. Three questions. You must be like, three questions? I'll answer that. You know, thank you for applying to USC. We'll send, you know, we send out admissions offers, offers in approximately three months. In the meantime, would you take the survey about the application process? Were you able to complete it? Were there any issues? Please let us know. Now there's another way to learn about our users. This is a little more involved. This may require a little more money. One, we're going to test on users. Mo this is where most companies go wrong. They test the website on company employees who already know the company. So if you're testing the USC website and you're testing it on USC employees, well, we kind of have an idea where things are. So we're already biased. 
Uh, and the worst ones you can test on, you ever hear of a hippo? It's an acronym for the highest paid person's opinion. This is usually a senior executive who may know nothing on website, about website design. But they'll come in and say, you know what, we should have a pop-up window that asks for everyone's email address. I see it every time I go shopping, that's the best practice. And that's usually where bad user experience comes from. Is a highly paid person who just comes in with an opinion that's not based on research. Obviously, if they're your boss, you have to listen to them, but at least you can give them a counter argument based on research of actual users. You know, actually we did a study, and when we did the study, 80% of the people who came to the website hated that pop-up window. And 20% entered a fake email address. Another 20% left the website. Because data doesn't always win, but at least you've covered yourself in the future when somebody says, hey, you know what? We're not getting any traffic on our website. Everyone's bailing because of the pop-up uh, pop window. Well, you have in writing your own recommendation. So that always covers you in the future. So we want to test it on different kinds of users. So we may have a lab that looks like this, a nice comfortable place. So when I say lab testing, it's not like we're going to put electrodes on their heads all right, and scare them. It's just a casual environment where we come in and we tell them, thanks for coming. Thank you. We're here to test the site. We're not testing you. We're not seeing what a good web surfer we are. We're gonna see how bad of a website we designed. So what we want you to do, we're gonna tell you, today this is your task. I want you to try to return a pair of shoes on our website. And success is when you get the confirmation email that says, you filled out the form accurately. We look forward to getting your shoes within two to four weeks. So you tell them what success is. You tell them what you want them to do and what success is. And once they knew that, now we watch. And we watch a lot of things. We're recording this. So one thing we're watching is what they do on the computer. So we can see where they click, where the mouse hovers, where they start to type and then erase. Uh, when they go to one section and they have bounce back to another section. So that's, that's one good thing, it's the process. Another thing that's really important is their body language. You'll see when people are frustrated. They, that heavy sigh will tell you more than a lot of clicks. Or they, I, had, I did this in my class where a student who had perfect vision, nice young eyes, actually leaned into the screen to try to find something. And I'll say, if a young person with perfect vision has to lean into the computer, something's wrong with the design. Now, if an older person is taking off their glasses, that tells you a lot. So body language. And the third thing is have them think out loud. Now, I'm a naturally vocal person, so my wife will hear me yelling from my office. And you're like, who are you yelling at? This website. I'm so angry at this website. You know, what happened the other day when I was trying to download some tax forms off into it, and they made me register, I was like, I just want my tax form. I don't want to register with you. And then when I clicked back, everything was blank and I had to start over again. I was like, I just filled out that thing, now I have to fill it out again because I hit, I hit the back button. So frustrating, right? You fill something out and it's gone. So that frustrated me and I needed the tax form so I couldn't go anywhere else. So if I were in that lab, they would have learned a lot from watching me and my language and my body uh, language and then they could have made their website better it just amazed me that they never tested their website to realize that if somebody hits the back button and then goes back the form that they spent time filling out blanks goes out so we watch them we have them think out loud actions speak louder than words if you're studying somebody and they ask a question I don't get this how do I find the shoe return section just ask them, why are you having trouble finding it? Don't give them tips. Why are you having trouble finding it? Well, I don't see the link. Because the link is like, the link is right there on the page. But you know what? It's buried. It's like 16 down over here. And they didn't scroll that far. 
So, and again, once they, once you identify the issues, we categorize them. Urgent, oh, the link is broken. They click the link and nothing happens. That's an urgent fix. Forms blank out when you hit the back button. That's an urgent fix. Important, well, you know, making returns easier is important. It's not urgent. So we don't have to do it tonight. Like a broken link needs to be fixed right now. Right now. Making returns easier, okay, maybe that's a two month process. Nice to have, you want that virtual chatting bot. That's nice to have, wait till we get funding. We'll do it next year. And one thing, one thing to note too, any kind of test that you do, you're testing one person. It's not statistically valid. You don't want to redesign your entire website. You're going to fix the urgent <coughs> things. But don't fix your entire website based on one person. You want to combine multiple test studies, surveys, and then later on, after your website's been up for a while, you will have analytical data. Google Analytics, Adobe Analytics, whatever analytics package you have that you can look <coughs> at and say, hmm, this website is, this page is not working. People are spending two seconds on this page when they should be spending 20, 30 seconds on this page. Let's go back to our lab tests and see what happened with this page. So as a website designer, you're accumulating a lot of research. There's also something called, this is a nice term to use in a job interview. Well, the Hawthorne effect is why I don't really like a lot of studies. Hawthorne effect, we behave differently when we're being watched. People will have trouble walking if we say, I'm going to watch you walk across the room. Suddenly their motor skills don't work as well as they used to. Suddenly they start tripping just because they're being watched. That's the problem with focus groups, interviews on TV. So what did you think of this movie? Yeah, I, yeah, good movie, fine. And then they go home, that was one of the worst movies I ever saw, but there's a television camera on me. So we have to take everything critically with a grain of salt. But this is very helpful. Any questions so far? All right. So now we got to the stage where we understand our users. Hopefully we've put all the pieces in place to help them find what they want. Here's some tips now on how to make your user experience better, regardless of testing. All right? I call this showtime because everything is about showing people. When somebody comes to your website, and you know this, show the users where they are on the website because not everyone enters on the home page. There's this assumption that a lot of web designers make is that they assume everything starts at the home page and goes through there. Because that's physical. It's like we all enter the store th through the front door. But if your store had doors all the way around, imagine if you were to go to Ralph's supermarket instead of the front door, there were doors everywhere. That would be a website. Doors everywhere. So you walk into Ralph's through the back door, where am I? Which section am I in? Am I in? How do I get to where I want to go? Because I suddenly entered in the dairy section, but I'm really looking for coffee. So how do I find this? And I always say, show the links, don't hide them. There's a common practice now that kind of bugs me, and that's called invisible menus. You need to hover over a certain area and the menu will appear. And I was like, why is there an invisible menu? Well, because it looks really good. And savvy web users will know to do this. I'm like, aha, that's a problem. How, what percentage of your users are savvy web users? Well, according to our study, 100%, right, because the non-savvy web users left. They quit. You turned off 90% of your audience and you didn't even know that. So don't create things for savvy web users. The invisible menus that pop up, control buttons. Unbelievably, Blackboard has invisible buttons. And I was like, who is Blackboard trying to impress aesthetically? No one goes in Blackboard and is like, what a beautiful site. It deserves an award. It should be 100% functional. It should be 100% functional. Now you can, there's obviously your needs too. So you obviously need to show people what they're seeking, but you can also show them what you want them to find and that's where some websites do, I call it internal advertising. But it could even be USC, might even want to put up a little box that says, you know, admit fair, come visit us, come get a free tour of campus. 
That may be something that USC wants to promote. Or, hey, have you heard of our new master's degree in communication management? Come check this out. Or if you're visiting the Annenberg Digital Lounge, they want to may pop up a little window that says, hey, next week, course on user interface design. This helps to show progress. We all like to know how close we are to achieving our goal. So, you know, if you realize that completing a task is a seven step process, you might even say you have completed five of seven steps. When you were applying to USC, hopefully they did this. You're almost done with your application. You've completed this many steps. You only have a few more to go. Now, I wish taxes were that easy because I think I'm done and all of a sudden, where did all this come from? So we like to see where we've been. And some of these practices, pretty common, you know them. You click on a link, it changes color. So you know, okay, I've been there. I don't have to click on that. But I've been to sites where they forgot to do that. So you keep clicking. Well, I was already on that page. Why didn't the link change color? I've already been there. You know breadcrumbs? Breadcrumbs are this thing where home and maybe it's programs. And MBA. So it's like a menu that follows and you can click on any one of these to get back to the main page. So this is called a breadcrumb. It's named after that fairy tale Hansel and Gretel where the little kids are lost in the woods so they leave a little trail of bread. It's not very user friendly to name a feature after a European fairy tale, but that's a breadcrumb. So this is also common practice. Help people know where they are in the site so they can go back and forth and jump back and forth here. Uh, don't you hate when you submit something and you want to know, well, did it upload? We like to see that little spinning wheel that says downloading, uploading, thinking. Right? So we want to see that progress. You start downloading a file, I like to see that little thing that says how close it is to being downloaded. 10, 15. I notice the iPhone lies because it always says we're almost done and then it takes me longer. Obviously shopping carts, when we add things to shopping carts, we like that little number that appears on the shopping cart. How many products do we have there? Or if I'm supposed to do a minimum $25 for free shipping, tell me how much, how much more I have to spend in order to get the free shipping. We want to see our progress. And then, again, user experience. Sometimes we can play with them because we may have our own needs. Somebody thinks they want something, maybe we recommend something better. So they're in the store. They're buying a computer, and you know, with Apple, there are a million kinds of computer. So they may even ask, what will you be using your computer for? Well, I'm going to be editing a lot of video. Well, then may we recommend this computer instead. That actually enhances user experience because they have a purpose, but they may be buying the wrong computer. They buy the cheapest possible computer, and then they come home, and it's really slow in editing video. And then they get angry at Apple. I was like, no, 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 no. Let's get you over the MacBook Pro. It's a little more expensive, but if you're going to be editing a lot of video, you're going to want the Pro, not the entry-level tablet. You're not going to want to edit a lot of videos using an iPad. So something better, upselling, cross-selling. Oh, we see you're interested in taking courses on marketing. Have you considered taking these three courses? They may be more related to your interests. You're really interested in social media? Take these three. We're enhancing the user experience beyond just what people want. And this is so important. We show clear instructions. I yell at Ikea every time I buy something because they give me a sheet with cartoons on it. And one screw looks like another screw. And I'm just trying to figure out which one goes here, which one goes here. It's like Ikea. There's something called video. Can you show me how to make this furniture using video? It'd be so much more helpful. And we know there are users of different levels. Some people, updating their LinkedIn profile comes naturally. The people who struggle the most on LinkedIn are top executives. 
they don't spend a lot of time on social media. And so they don't know, for example, that you can change the order of your jobs if they're all current because the buttons are hidden. And if they did something wrong, tell them. What did you do wrong? I always, don't you hate when you create a password and say password is not acceptable? Why? And then why didn't they tell me in the beginning that my password needed to have a capital letter and a number and a symbol? They tell me after I've tried to come up with a password. I, I actually had a site that says, invalid, that told me invalid password because the password I used was name of company sucks. And that was an invalid password. I was like, I bet you if I change the word from sucks, it'll be okay. And I did. But I was like, okay, you didn't tell me I couldn't use certain words in developing a password. So showing is good UX. Tell people what they're doing. Now let's talk. Some of you probably came here hoping for a few more design tips. Let me tell you some design tips that'll help make your site a little more user friendly. First and foremost, people are coming to your site, most people are coming to your site for information. Now I told you before, some of this information may come in the form of a photograph, it may come in the form of a video. But if they're looking to read something, legibility is the most important rule of all. And a lot of web designers think of text as a design element. Does, this, does the page look cool? And so if you have a restaurant, we're designing a website for a restaurant, and you think of what people are going to a website for for a restaurant. They may want to see the menu. They want to see the hours. But you know, this, I have a fancy French restaurant, so I want everything in cursive. And we all know that cursive is really hard to read. And I was like, I. You know, is that a vegetarian dish? I can't tell. So, because they wanted the menu so elegant. And in fact, not only is it in cursive, the text is written on a photograph of one of the dishes. And the text is white, and the dish has noodles in it. So the white text disappears on the white background. It's a horrible user experience, but boy, did it look good, and it won a design award. And I'm always fascinated at how many design winning websites have terrible user experience. It looks so good. We made it entirely black with gray letters on a black background. And yeah, that looks great. Users hated it. Even Apple, who we value for the user experience, loves gray text. The default text color on most keynote presentations is gray. I go through and I have to change all the text to black. Because I'm projecting something on a screen, and if I have light gray text and a white background, wow, that looks so modern. It looks like steel. But somebody in the back row can't read it. They can't read it. So I'm not going to use that. So large type, especially if you have older readers, minimum text for old eyes is 16 pixels. Now here's where age may matter. If you're designing Snapchat where the vast majority of users are under the age of 30, you could probably get away with small text. But USC, where I've got a lot of professors who are getting on in years, don't tell them I said that, but a lot of professors are getting on in years, I'm gonna want larger text and how to do things. Blackboard should certainly have large text because all the professors are trying to set up classes. Something else. Narrow columns, short paragraphs. Now, a lot of designers think it's cool to have the text go all the way from margin to margin. But we don't like to read like we're going down a train track. It's not fun for us. Short columns, text. I'll give you some examples. I'll show you some examples in a second. Cardinal rule, and this is one that's broken all the time. This is the biggest argument between me and my design partner. Because he's an award-winning designer, I'm a writer. I'm uh, like, this is okay for a headline, all right? We can read that, no reverse type of body copy. But you can imagine if you were reading one of your textbooks and everything was white text and a black background. You wouldn't like it for very long. It causes eye strain. It also hurts learning, because they've done studies where they gave people entire papers 
and said, read it like this, and they gave other people normal papers. The people who had this kind of type, reverse type, didn't learn as much, didn't remember as much, and didn't enjoy reading it. But it looks good. That's not user experience. So that's where UI and UX will come into conflict. The user interface, this looks so good. User experience, yes, but no one likes to read it. So we don't do this for body copy, and yet it's the, it's the hottest fad out there today. I went to go check out, I love, love movies, I go to movie websites, it's all reverse type because Hollywood loves a black background with white text. Or gray text is the worst, gray and black. Not enough contrast there. So study after study after study shows black text on white or black on yellow are the strongest forms of readability. You know, that's why a lot of traffic warning signs are black text on a yellow background. And then avoid italics, cursive, any overstylized type, and never comic sans. And the only reason I say never comic sans, there's nothing wrong with reading it, it just makes you look like a children's cartoon. And so this, this will get you laughed out of a room if you use this on a non-children's website. But you can see how hard this is, is to read. Italics too. One italicized word in the headline is okay. But if you have an entire paragraph that's in italics, not readable. And some sites will do this when they're quoting somebody. You know, according to Bill Gates, boom, huge paragraph of text, unreadable. So people just, what we do is we skip it. Not that we can't read it. We can, and you guys can, you're young. You can look at anything, you can read it. And the designers in there, I can read it. But we generally don't like reading off a screen. It's why e-books have not dominated. People are still buying paper books when they have to read a book. Because we prefer not to read on a screen, unless it's clear. If it's not clear, we'll just skip it. I'm not gonna read it. We just make the choice not to read it. So I wanna show you a couple of examples. Uh, Yahoo Sports used to be one of the biggest, most popular sports site on the internet. And then they got a new CEO, and a lot of times when a new executive comes in, they make their stamp by redesigning everything. We're gonna rebrand, we're gonna redo the logo, redesign everything. So overnight, Yahoo Sports went from this to this. And notice the little type. If I'm looking at these scores, and for me, when I'm looking at scores, I wanna score quickly. What's the score of the Oklahoma State and I have to do this and squint and then get up close? This bothers me. And this was actually an improvement because at least here, they really ghosted back the image. Their first iteration, which I should have grabbed, was a clear photo on the background, very sharp, with text on top of it. And I was like, you're giving me sports news. I need news quickly. I can't read this. This is tiny. It's blue on black. How am I supposed to read that quickly? And the designer says, well, I can read it. Well, yes, you designed it, and you're, you're making the effort. I don't want to make the effort. And you know who's really angry? The advertiser. Because the advertiser, above all, wants us to be legible. This is, this looks nice. I mean, look. Yeah, it's not going to win any design awards. It's modular. It's up there. It's kind of boring. Ah, now we're going to win awards. People gave up and they went over to ESPN. They switched because we have options on the internet. I don't have to use Yahoo Sports or other sports websites. I can go to one or I can look at the score quickly. Guess what? Yahoo has now switched back, but it's too late. The damage is done. We've switched. Here's another site. Tygon is a luxury site. And when you look at that, that burgundy color. And so burgundy is our theme, red is our theme, lush, velvet. So let's build our whole website with white text on the background. And you can see what happens when we stretch the text all across. We just don't want to read it. We don't want to go there. 
So they took a look at this, and after a while, probably looking at data, doing user testing, they finally updated it. So now it's like this. And people were sad because they say, well, that doesn't look luxurious anymore. It's readable. They still have an issue. It still stretches from margin to margin. So it's still hard to read, but at least the paragraphs are short. So they're getting there. They're making progress. But this may be one of the most controversial aspects of user experience that you will encounter and that will get you into fights with your designers because they will want to do this. And you will want them to do this. And, then, and one thing that you can always do, the beauty of the internet is we can test everything. We're saying, fine. We'll show this to 50% of our visitors and tell the server to show this to the other 50% of our visitors. Now let's track the data. How much time was spent on the page? How many people bounced off the page or exited off the page? Did the people who entered on this page buy more than people who entered on the other page? And after thousands and thousands of visitors, we'll be able to have an argument. Yahoo found out very quickly that their new design wasn't working. The data told the story. So whenever you get in this situation, just say, tell the designer, humor me. Let's do it this way. And look, if we want to make this luxurious, you can make the margins. Use photographs, use a video. There are millions of ways to make this look luxurious without hurting the legibility. Okay. Questions so far? Yes. So right now there's a very popular design trend where everything is bold. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, if everything is bold, then nothing is bold. Okay. Because bold is supposed to be emphasis. Otherwise, it just looks like heavy text. And heavy text is fine for reading, but then now what do you do if you want to emphasize something? You can. Mm -hmm. And also it's now going to be harder, especially headlines, the way we tend to read as people is we'll scan a page, the headlines pop to us, right, that tells about a news section. You're also making it harder for Google to find out what's important in your site because Google says bold face and headlines are important. And so Google says, what's important to you? And you say everything, and Google says, well, tough for you. We're not going to give you everything. We're going to find out what's important. So bold facing, still legible. You're just limiting your options in the future. Also, another thing is all capital letters. And we know this. All capital letters in a headline, fine. If you put it in body copy, all capital letters is seen as shouting. And it's also study show having everything in all capital letters makes it harder to read, which is why the Surgeon General warnings on cigarette packages were put in all capital letters because the cigarette companies didn't want you to read it. Look at warnings sometimes. Whenever the government makes anybody put in a warning, that's when they intentionally do bad design because they don't want you to read it. We're going to put it in a little type at the bottom. Maybe put it in a reverse type. The government says we just have to have the words, but we don't want people to read it. So let's make them really bad. Now, other things to help your users. Let's go smarter search. So I've noticed a lot of sites, people go straight to the search. I've done this in my classroom where I, where I give them the LA Times website. And I say, go find the weather, today's weather on the Los Angeles Times. Every single time I've done this in my class, a student goes up straight to the search engine and types in weather. I was like, they didn't even bother looking at the menu. I thought that was interesting. So you almost have to have a search these days on every site. Because that's naturally where people go. I'm guilty of it too. On my own website, if I'm trying to find an old article, I'll use the search engine instead of digging through the menu. We are now so custom to search helping us out. So one nice thing that we can do on our websites is when people are searching, and you notice this on Google, we start suggesting things for them. So if they're on USC and they start typing ADM, obviously we think they're probably looking for admissions, not administration. So we suggest, you want admissions? Okay, cool. It's a subtle thing, but it helps with user experience. Um, it also helps if you know how people are gonna misspell things. Obviously everyone misspells syllabus. I have to look it up every now and then to figure out how many L's in syllabus again? So if they start typing syllabus, we autocorrect and suggest you are already looking at the syllabus for this class. So suggesting keywords is really nice to have. 
especially if they're common searches. So we show the most common searches that people are looking for. And even when they get into a category, let them search within the category. So for example, if they're inside Annenberg and they're searching for admissions, they want Annenberg admissions. They don't want the Leventhal School of Accounting admissions. So searching within categories is nice too on a giant site like USC. Hi, I want to find a class on design. Well, you certainly don't want the engineering school. The engineering school has design courses. You don't want that. You want courses on design here. Now, this is, this is also fun. We are now using search engines as our consultants. And Google has noticed this, that a lot of searches now consist of questions, right? How do I get a tax refund? Where can I get a passport? So if you really want a nice user experience, you enable people to ask questions. This is obviously more work for you. But if you've done your user research, you know what kind of questions do people ask? I mean, one of these, how much is tuition at USC? Very common question. Very hard to find the answer. USC buries it. So you're digging and digging, and you know what? You're just frustrating users because it's information they ultimately need to have. I wanted to know where do I park at University Village? Very hard to find that answer. Because I didn't want to come on campus and spend $12 to stop at Trader Joe's. But I don't see the giant park here signs like you do at the mall. So I was like, you know what? I'm not bothering. I can go to Trader Joe's later. So people are asking these questions. Hey, where can I get a pizza on campus? So you can say, well, there's a California Pizza Kitchen over here. Question? All right. For those of you working in shopping, or any place else really, where you want people to complete a process and they give up. I would love to know how many people start applying to USC and give up. Most of the applications are online now. I would love to see that data. I don't know that data. But there's a, a lot of cases that may have been the user experience. What happened here? So this is the saddest thing. If you work in e-commerce, the abandoned shopping cart. In fact, jobs are won or lost on the ability to reduce shopping cart abandonment. Because we work so hard to show them products, get them to add it to the shopping cart. They're almost done and they leave. Why? So here are a whole bunch of tips for those of you who are going to wind up working in e-commerce. And it happens in almost every industry. Number one reason people abandon shopping carts. Whoa. That shipping was really expensive. Now, this again will get you into arguments. Because you're going to be in a company where they say, we don't tell people the shipping because our shipping is really high. So we, f we think that if they add the shopping carts and then they see the shipping, they'll go ahead and pay for the shipping. Well, you're also going to wind up with a lot of banned shopping carts. And I've done this where I was like, I see an ad, oh, that's a great looking t-shirt. I would love to have a t-shirt with the logo on it. I had a shopping cart, shipping is 20 bucks for a t-shirt. There's no chance. Wouldn't it be better to save everyone the time that has them just tell me up front, shipping is $20 at our company. I'm like, okay, maybe then if I'm gonna buy 40 t-shirts, okay, I'll, I'll be willing to spend $20 in shipping. Well, let me know in advance. Uh, so those charges, hidden charges, that's not good user experience. You may think you're psyching out your users by hiding the price at the end. It just makes them angry. All right? uh, we talked about the registration and the unnecessary questions before. And I've been to stores where it's like, I want to buy something, and they just keep asking me questions. I was like, you know what? I don't need this. This is something that we all, every site you go to has this little box that says, enter discount code here. Well, sometimes there's no discount code, and the user is frantically running around the internet looking for a discount code. Because we don't want to, we don't mind paying, we don't want to be ripped off. So if we think there's a discount and we're not going to get it, we abandon the shopping cart until we find a discount code. And we'll wait. We create urgency. 
This is, a, this is a little bit of user experience, but we tell people how much is left in stock. Amazon does this all the time. Only two left in stock. Now you know they've got a warehouse where they've got 2,000, but they'll tell you only two left in stock. So we sign up. Or we say this offer is only good for a few days. That actually might be helpful for user experience because I go in, I'll go into sites and I'll see something's on sale. Well, how long is the sale for? Is this one of those sites with the perpetual sales? Or is this something I need to do now? I bet you had these students tell me that they, I just was like, why did you sign up for my class? And they said, because of, it said that uh, it was almost sold out. I was like, that's the reason you signed up for my class? Yeah, it sounded like it was good. I was like, okay. Students want to know how popular a class is. That's user experience. And a class is like only, there are 30 seats available and 28 are filled. They're going to register and then decide later on whether or not to drop the class. But at least they got in. Uh, showing, this is interesting, and this came from a study. I would never have imagined it myself. When you add something to your shopping cart, you like to see a little picture of the product. Because the name may not, mean, the may, name may not remind you what you bought. And I was like, wow, really? That makes a difference? Yeah, just a little picture. Make it easy to edit the cart. I've had this frustration too, where I accidentally added something to the cart. I was like, you know what? I don't really need that. I thought I needed batteries, but I just found a whole bunch of batteries at home. Okay, how do I get the batteries off? When I have to start over, if I start over, it blanks out the entire cart. I can't adjust the number. Or, you know, I add something to the cart and I said, oh, you know what? I really need two of these. Oh, in order to add two, you have to go back to the shopping page and buy again. I was like, well, I'm not going to bother. This is way too much trouble to buy anything. Make it easy to contact customer service. What if you have an urgent question about a product before you buy it? And we certainly do. Is this compatible with a Mac? Because I'd hate to buy a hard drive and not have it work. And the product description didn't say. Uh, will this class have a lot of statistics in it? Because I really don't want to take a class where I have to use spreadsheets. You know, is there going to be a lot of team projects? I'm sure when you sign up for classes, you have questions about the classes that you're taking. And, and it's like, does it frustrate you to not know? And so you show up on the first day of class or not. Uh, make it easy to return to shopping. This, I think, is where Amazon is at fault. And Amazon's usually really good at it. But once you're deep inside the shopping process, you're like, oh man, I forgot, I have to go buy this. I was like, okay, how do I get back to the shopping? Some sites have continue shopping now. And so you can add more things. Uh, other uh, Offer other payment options besides credit card. It sounds pretty basic, but a lot of young people don't have credit cards or they don't have access to their parents' credit cards. So I'm seeing now more and more sites saying you can buy with Venmo, obviously PayPal, um, lots of different ways to buy things. Or maybe I was in the middle of shopping and my boss caught me. I'm not supposed to be, because Black Friday and Cyber Monday, most of the shopping is actually done at work. That's American productivity for you. So people are there shopping, shopping, shopping. Oh, boss is coming. Wouldn't it be nice if you just hit save and then you continue your shopping later if you wanted to? But not every site gives you that option. Amazon at, le at least lets you save the cart for later. But I've been to other sites where I'm shopping at things to the cart. I was like, oh man, I have got a meeting. Now I have to start over again. And if I have to start over, that's friction. I don't want the friction. I'm going to abandon it. Now some sites... And I, I just did this the other day where I added something to a cart, didn't buy it. I got an email. Hey, we noticed you left this in your cart. Did you want to buy it? It's proven it does work, but you ought to send one. Two, three times, now that's harassment. And it's a bad user experience. Now what people do not like, and I'm glad to see that Safari and some other websites are now enabling people to block it. It's called the retargeting ad. This is the ad that follows you across the web. So you go into Nordstrom's, you check out something. Hey, that looks like a cheap, that looks like a great looking pair of shoes. You go to Nordstrom's, $350 for a pair of shoes? No, thank you. 
But now for the rest of your life, as you go around the web, there's that Nordstrom's $350 pair of shoes. And it's really bad if you were thinking about buying that pair of shoes for somebody else as a gift, and they go over and look at your computer. And they're like, oh, that's a good looking pair of shoes. It's like, I was going to buy that for you for Valentine's Day, but now that you've seen it. The truth is, um, between 80 and 90% of customers hate those retargeting ads. Now, the shopping people will tell you, yes, but the 10% who like it, we can get sales from them. Well, again, that's a judgment call for you as a company. Are you willing to offend 80 to 90% of your customers for the sake of the 10? Now, let's look at some, there's something called look and feel. Uh, does anyone need a break? You all good? All right. Tons of information coming at you. It's like drinking from a fire hose. But look and feel. When designer is designing the user experience, remember everything is user experience. So we sometimes talk about look and feel. How does it make you feel to go through the site? Here's some caveats. I want some things I want you to remember. Faster downloads are really, really important. And Google is starting to rank websites on how fast they download. This is especially true on mobile phones. If someone's trying to access your site on a phone, how quickly does it download? And I know a lot of designers who have been called back to simplify the design because at first they created this design that was just like, oh, big, gorgeous pictures. And that background video that's playing and the parallax effect where when you scroll down the page, things look like they're moving. Well, that's all beautiful and it wins design awards but studies have shown, I saw a recent study that said if a website takes five seconds or longer to download, you lose 40% of potential customers. Think about all the trouble it took to get people to come to your website. Remember what I showed you on Facebook? One person out of 10,000 clicks on an ad. You get that click one out of 10,000 and after five seconds, they're gone if they have a choice. Now, you have to go to the IRS website, all right, fine. In actuality, government websites are pretty fast because they don't put up a lot of pictures. But the designers, I know big pictures look great. I know videos are great, but I'm not willing to lose 40% of my customers for that. So we're gonna do load testing, and your programmer will know how to compress a photo in a lot of cases to make it download faster. We do not want an old-fashioned websites. Websites change in design all the time. But be careful about just chasing fads. Reverse text is a fad. Everyone's doing it. We're not necessarily going to chase it. Pop-up windows asking for your email address, they're a fad. So whenever there's something new and a designer suggests to you, hey, this is a trend, big pictures are a trend, putting everything in bold faces are a trend, we have to ask, okay, what's it gonna cost? And in all honesty, how big is this fad? Does this fad apply to the entire world or just some kinds of websites? Because you know, we're doing a sports website here, so I know it's a fad to have big pictures in the background, but my readers want scores. And so I don't want to put up pictures if they look for scores. If it looks like an ad, people won't click it. So you have a box. It's funny, we humans, have, nowadays, if we put a box around something on our homepage, that looks like an ad. So we naturally just skip over it. If it's something on the right-hand side that's really important, we won't even see it because now we're used to all the ads being on the right. So don't do that. Animation is really popular. In some cases, animation can be useful. But it has to have use. It's not impulsive animation. It's not gratuitous animation. And never have anything that flashes. Not just because it's annoying when you go to a website that's like flashing, special, special, special of the day. You may also be violating the Disabilities Act for people with epilepsy. Because people have gone into shock from going onto a website that's got flashing. And you know what we all hate? And yet they're doing it all the time, it's a fact, autoplay videos. 
You go to a website, give me the choice of whether or not I want to watch a video. But tons of websites are doing autoplay videos. Others are autoplaying music. And you're sitting there in the library and all of a sudden music comes on, you visit a website, and you're like, where's that off button for the music? That's really annoying. The reason they have autoplay videos is because the videos often start with an ad. And so they want to make sure that they charge the advertisers as much as possible. But guess what? The new Chrome is going to block autoplay videos. And the new Safari is going to block. Yeah, I'm celebrating too. Isn't it annoying? You go to a website and they just start playing. The sports websites are guilty of this. The news websites are guilty of this. Because they want to push advertising on you. Bad user experience. Good for you know, good for your bottom line if you're selling ads, bad for the users. I, I started off this lecture talking about the pop-ups. Even for email newsletters, they're annoying. And here's something that Google decided. On a phone, if you have an ad that covers up most of your website, and people have a hard time clicking around it, Google starts punishing your website and search rankings. Because the truth is, no one has ever intentionally clicked on a phone ad in their lives. It's all accidental. Mm -hmm. All accidental. You're trying to uh, click on the ad. So be careful of pop-ups. Now, there's some kinds of things, some pop-ups that are helpful. If you have a symbol that people don't know and you want to use a symbol, at least have that rollover text so when somebody hovers over it, some words pop up and say, this is the menu. Uh, when I go into Gmail, I look at some of their buttons, and they have a lot of arrows. And I was like, I wish I knew which arrow was reply and which arrow was forward. Because I don't necessarily want to reply to the person. That actually might be bad. Because I might say, you know, let's not do business with these guys. They're idiots. And I hit the reply button instead of forwarding it to my partner. So... People don't understand what the symbols or icons mean. Help them. Now let me talk a little bit about designing for mobile. This is becoming increasingly important. For the first time ever, more than 50% of all traffic is from a phone. Now it varies on websites. Right? The social media websites, a lot of mobile access. Shopping websites are getting there. But obviously, we don't apply to college on our phone. It's too intricate. But still, we need to think about designing for mobile in mind. And these are some of the user experience rules for designing for mobile. Uh, the dominant thing right now is having a responsive website. That means the website knows what kind of device you're coming from, whether it's a PC or phone or a tablet. And it adjusts accordingly. The site adjusts in size. It may have even a slightly different layout. You may create an entirely separate mobile site. ESPN does this for sports. The mobile ESPN is very different from the website ESPN. Obviously, that's expensive. ESPN can afford it. Most of us can. But when we design for um, the mobile phone, some things are pretty obvious for, to us. Yes, it's a small screen. So, you know, you're not going to want to put lots of tables and charts. So, yes, you can do this. Make something bigger. But guess what? Even that is friction. Really? I have to make it bigger? I'm not. I'm just not even going to look at the chart if I have to widen and zoom in. We have to understand that in most cases, we don't have a mouse when we're using the phone. So there's no hover over experience. If we can't hover, if we can't put our mouse over something, we're so used to on the on our computers, well is this clickable? Well I hover over it and then it becomes a hand. That obviously doesn't happen on our phone. So on a phone we have to make very clear what is a button? What is a link? Once upon a time all links had a line underneath them, but designers decided, well that looks ugly to put a line under a word. So they just change the color of the word to say, this is a link. But some websites, every other word is colored. You know, on USC, everything's cardinal or gold. So I don't know if that's a link. I don't know if, I don't know if this 
is a button or a bullet point? I don't know. So sometimes we have to go back to 1995 and put the words click here on the page. Because they're on the phone. Click here for more information. Click here. Because people just don't know. And yes, we can all turn our phones horizontally. But even Instagram knows we're more likely to be vertical. I mentioned this earlier, fast, 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 fast. There's actually a Google programming language called AMP, designed to make your mobile websites faster. I don't teach programming, I don't know exactly how it works, I just know that my programming guys know about AMP. And for mobile phones, we try to minimize the amount of typing. So you can imagine shopping on a mobile phone if you have to type in your address all the time. I like it when I go, when I'm shopping on a phone and it says log in with PayPal, because PayPal, my PayPal already has all my shipping information on it. So I was like, oh cool, log in with PayPal, I'm done. Now, I wish more mobile sites used my fingerprint reader, so I didn't even have to log in. And I'm hoping to see, and maybe with face recognition, we won't have to log in anymore. We just show our faces or our fingerprints. Biometric registration, they call it, or biometric logins. So we hope that's a future. But people aren't going to type a lot. This may hurt, you know, when we're going to do our user studies. If, we do the, if they do a survey on their phone, they may not type as much, may not give us as much information, in which case surveys on phones are probably best with multiple choice. You may not get the nice open-ended answers, but people just don't want to type a lot. But dude, people my age, I'm still the person who texts one finger at a time. I don't have your texting skills. The two thumb texting, forget it. I'm not going to do it. My generation is still one finger at a time. And pity the guy with the big hands. Your football players are not going to be typing a million words per second. I mentioned this, make sure links and buttons are clear. And avoid the pop-ups and ads that cover a whole screen. And a lot of cases don't require a lot of reading. Some people read ebooks on their phones, but, I, but a lot of people aren't. They download the ebooks and they want it on a tablet or the computers. So if you have something that requires a lot of reading, it's nice to have a little button that says save for later. Facebook does that. Facebook innovated this said, okay, there's an article I want to read. I'm not going to read it now. I click the button that says, says save for later. And then Facebook says, you have three saved articles. I was like, okay, now I'm on my computer. I will take time to read it, print it out. If you have a lot of information to convey and your audience is mobile, consider using video. Consider using video instead of tons of text. Uh, user experience. Maps help people find things. I wish my local Ralph's supermarket had a map I could download when I'm in the store. I was like, where are the pickles? I can't find the pickles anywhere because there's no pickle section. Uh, USC, it would be nice if I'm on the USC website and there's, we notice you're using mobile. Would you like a map of campus? Yeah, it'd be great. And it shows me exactly where I'm at particularly now that they've renamed all the parking garages and I don't know which parking garage is which. So it's like, help me out, USC. I'm on campus. Give me a map. Sharing on mobile needs to be done with a basic button. Can we copy and paste on a phone? Yes. It's a real pain to copy and paste an address on a phone. Copy and paste text on a phone anything. So we have great big sharing buttons. Share this website now. And now lastly, I want to tell you about some trends that are coming up in user experience. By the way, if you'd like a copy of these slides, um, I gave some to Josh. I'm also happy you can contact me later and I can send you a larger version. Yeah, what's your, what's your email? Oh, I'll, I'll show it to you at the end. Yeah, so feel free to contact me, and I'll send you a copy, because I know some of you are typing feverishly, and I'm going pretty fast. Okay, 
some trends that are coming up in user experience. And some of these are forecasts. People are trying to predict what's going to happen. But some of these, uh, your generation is going to lead on it. I mentioned simpler authentication. Usernames, passwords, we know they're all being hacked. And even USC's website with the dual factor authentication, that's just creating fiction, friction. Fingerprint readers are now on all our phones. They should really be using it more. Same with uh, if they're going to be doing the facial recognition with the iPhone 8 and the iPhone X, that may become the future. It'd be interesting if you could sit down to your computer and Blackboard automatically recognizes who you are and starts giving you your courses. Easier registration and payments. Again, if we can tie payment information to a fingerprint, obviously the new Amazon store that they have in Seattle, it's like you don't even go to a cash register. right? You just walk in and out. This will help stores like Amazon. How do we tie everything into a fingerprint or a face to make pe enable people to buy things more easily? Linear navigation, simple linear navigation. It means giving people fewer choices. When they're on a website, they come to a website, all they have an option of is back or forward. So it's like, hi, welcome to a website. You would like to register for a class, page one, page two. We do this a lot, we call them landing pages and you'll notice this with a lot of websites now so for example if you type in you'll see Annenberg Masters in Communication Management it doesn't send you to the regular USC Annenberg website they send you to a specific landing page for the program you just scroll you just scroll there's no, no menu options, you scroll, and then they have a form you fill out. So for simple tasks, this is becoming more popular. Just um, Lyft actually has a very good one for signing up Lyft drivers. If you're interested in being a Lyft driver, it's simple. Just scroll, type in this information, scroll, type in this information. Obviously, it's going to be a little more, it's not possible for everything, but Nowadays we're thinking, let's make everything simple for people, step by step. The future is voice, and we're already getting there with Alexa and Siri and Google. Now, this is one of those nice to have features. I don't know if USC is willing to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to make sure the USC website is voice activated, but that will be the future. Now, one of the challenges is you can imagine the number of accents and languages you have to accommodate for if you use voice control. Similar to voice control is that conversation user interface. People like the little chat window that comes down and asks you things. We don't necessarily want to dig through websites to get the information anymore. We just want to say, here's what I need to know. Larger headlines, shorter blocks of text. It's almost like these days, one sentence is a paragraph. One sentence is a paragraph. So as a writer, I've, you know, I've been writing on the internet since the 90s. I'm teaching myself to be a little more concise. Unless I'm writing a full-on magazine article, a blog article, keep it tight. Because that's, that's what people like. Videos are replacing text, particularly on home pages. So... They're the full-on welcome. Used to be you go to a homepage and the text, welcome to USC. You know, established in the year 1880, USC is a leading blah, blah, blah. Now it's a video that does the greeting for them. So creative directors, webmasters are starting to become video producers and video directors. More feedback and errors. We call this failure mapping. I didn't even know this was, this was a career option. We... People design websites, we actually try to break the website. We go through, we do all these errors, we'll see what could come up. And then giving more feedback so we don't say, you know, invalid entry, incorrect. Because you know, and let's say ordering a product for, you know, you're shopping, you have to type in your address and the date and the shipping address and so on. You may type in something wrong. 
and all they do is they say wrong, and you have to go back and you have to figure out what's wrong. Okay, what did I do wrong? Sites are now, I notice more and more shopping sites are actually suggesting an address for you. Did you mean this address? Because they're, they're calling from the database. More personalization, recommendations everywhere. Now this is privacy advocates up in arms. Because are they recording everything I do? They know my face. Facebook sold them my entire life. Facebook knows everything about me. On the other hand, we may like it if we're signing up for courses at USC and we know the kinds of courses we like. But it scares us if they also know what kind of grades we got in the previous course. I was like, no, Freddie, you really don't want to take the advanced finance class. We saw what you got in finance. Mm -hmm. So here, why don't you take this course, ballroom dancing instead. So, but the future is going to be personalized. And more and more data is out there on us. Integration of all devices continue anywhere. I noticed this on, uh, I think it was DirecTV, where it shows somebody stopping to watch a show on their TV, pick up their phone, and the phone knows where they pause the show. And they'll be able to continue. This integration, I think, is going to be more important as we all switch from multiple devices throughout the day. And be nice to know, okay, this is where you left off, continue here. All right. So in the past 90 minutes or so, I just gave you a lot of basics and intro to UX. This is something that people specialize in. Their entire websites on it. All right. These are some of the major websites. Not that one. Okay. On user experience. Baymart Institute, hardcore researchers, in case you have to write a paper. And some of these others, this one, the Interaction Design Foundation offers classes. So if you want to go much deeper than obviously what we could do today in two hours, you can go take classes in the Interaction Design Foundation. They also have articles. These are more like blogs and studies, UX matters and boxes and arrows. Boxes and arrows tends to be a little more design centric as opposed to the total user experience. If you would like to connect with me, this is my LinkedIn address. I just use my name, freddynager.com. Type that in, you'll get to me on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with anybody at USC. And you will create a LinkedIn profile. Talked about that. And here's my email. And if you would like a copy of these slides, just email me fnager at usc.edu.